Okay, members, the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy, and I call Jerry Kelly. Can I uh, thank the member for his question um, and indicate that direct negotiations with the European Commission uh, as a matter of international relations are the responsibility of our national government, the United Kingdom government. I therefore have had no engagement with the European Commission on establishing a European office in Belfast. My work with our government has focused on the issues facing businesses. This is informed by the issues businesses raise with me or my officials. Businesses have not raised this issue with me. Supplementary, Jerry Kelly. I thank the Minister for her uh, answer up to now. Um, when, when, I mean, last week, our economy committee um, heard from uh, business leaders who told us that the retained access to the EU single market, as the Minister will know, must be supplemented by good relations with the EU going forward. And we have consulates for other major trading partners in Belfast, such as the US and China. So how does the, the minister justify her position? And I, I know she didn't say this in her meeting, but it's known uh, in her answer. To an EU office in Belfast to engage with uh, the enormous European uh, consumer benefits of uh, being a part of the EU. In conjunction with the EU. So um, we will, um, of course, look to trade with the European Union. We will uh, look to have good relations with the European Union. It is regrettable that our national government have imposed the protocol, which imposes a huge raft of European laws and regulations in Northern Ireland um, that are costly to businesses, costly to consumers, and costly to our economy. And of course, the Northern Ireland Executive retains uh, the Northern Ireland Office, our Bureau, in Brussels, uh, which will be responsible for those relations in the future. I call Gary Middleton. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister for her answers? Uh, clearly, Minister, it is uh, for the national government uh, to uh, lead in discuss discussions with the European Union. But does the Minister agree with me that it is important that the UK government stands up for the interests of Northern Ireland uh, and ensures that it uh, clearly um, puts across the position that we no longer will accept the protocol? Can I thank the member for his question? It is, of course, absolutely imperative that our government uh, continues to stand up for Northern Ireland, um, and not just with intermittent uh, grace periods, but by providing a permanent and complete solution to the issues of the protocol, one that respects Northern Ireland's place in the United Kingdom's internal market and respects Northern Ireland's constitutional position within the United Kingdom. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, can I ask you what alternative have you got for an Irish Sea border? It is nothing short of Brexit con con constipation to keep talking about technological solutions, alternative arrangements and, God forbid, the Malthouse arrangements. What alternative are you offering to the people in this Assembly and to the rest of Northern Ireland to the current sea border? Can I again thank the member for her question? Um, and um, No, I'm not going to go down uh, the metaphor route at all on this one, but uh, can I thank the member for her question? Um, the Irish, uh, or the Czechs uh, across the Irish Sea, are bringing um, costs to businesses, costs to consumers, lack of uh, consumer choice. I spoke to a business this morning who indicated to me very, very clearly 
that the cost of the protocol to his business this year would be somewhere in the region of £500,000. That is an enormous cost which will eventually be passed on to consumers, will be passed on to families and will be reflected in the cost of living for those families. I and my party were very, very clear that we have never wanted the Northern Ireland Protocol and we do not see that a border between us and checks between us and our largest market is of any value whatsoever to the economy or to businesses in Northern Ireland. And therefore, I would ask again that those parties that support the protocol, that support the rigorous implementation of the protocol, review that support for the protocol so that your party leader won't have to write to me and ask me for special schemes to support businesses who are, encourage, are incurring costs through the protocol. I call Jim Hollister. Thank you. Uh, whereas our feudal overlords in Brussels imposing their laws on our economy and our people without consent may think it befitting of our state of vassalage that they should impose themselves through a permanent presence as Governor Generals in Belfast. Will the Minister assure me that she is in the business of expelling, not facilitating, and under the protocol? I, of course, have made it perfectly clear in my answer that, of course, negotiations with the European Commission um, are a matter for our national government. I neither see the need nor feel the want to have a European office in Belfast. They call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question two. With your permission, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would wish to group questions uh, numbers two and three. And again, with your permission, I would like to avail of an extra minute to answer this grouping. On the 25th of February, I launched my Economic Recovery Action Plan, which outlines the decisive actions that I plan to take to support our economy as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Rebuilding a greener economy is at the heart of this plan. This includes actions focused on encouraging the development of a greener future in areas such as clean energy, green innovation and energy efficiency. The plan also reaffirms my commitment to the development of the hydrogen and circular economy. Later this month, I will launch an options consultation on my new energy strategy. I expect substantial investment and economic recovery opportunities to arise from the new policies for decarbonising energy in Northern Ireland. Enabling a skilled, low-carbon workforce will be key on delivering this. Embracing and investing in environmentally friendly opportunities offers the Northern Ireland economy the opportunity to build resilience, increase productivity, create jobs, strengthen competitiveness, and realise carbon, energy and cost savings. It is crucial that funding is made available at the earliest opportunity for my economic recovery plan so that it can have the maximum impact. I look forward to working with the Finance Minister and indeed all of my executive colleagues in the coming weeks to ensure that we can rebuild our economy to be more competitive, more inclusive and more environmentally sustainable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. But a green recovery will, not, well, will involve not just green stimulus and investment to create jobs, of which there is none in the economic recovery plan, but also it requires new ways of measuring progress. So can I ask the Minister whether or not she will adopt or consider any alternative economic models in her plans for COVID-19 recovery, including alternative ways to measure prosperity and address inequalities in wealth and income? Again, can I thank the member uh, for her question? Um, I, of course, um, want uh, the Economic Recovery Action Plan not just to create uh, a stable 
um, and prosperous Northern Ireland, but to create a more equal Northern Ireland, including a more equally regionally balanced economy. Um, I will uh, look at all of these measures as we continue to work our way through that economic recovery plan. But I say to my colleagues here in the House, it is absolutely important that we get the investment for that economic recovery plan, that we begin the journey of reopening, rebuilding and recovering our economy. That is the way to provide inclusive growth for the future. I call Stuart Dixon. Um, thank you, Minister, for, for your answers. But do you not recognise that unless uh, your economic recovery plan includes uh, the whole area of uh, the green economy, and that that will require you to work together with other ministers to deliver that, that it is not something that you can do on your own, or indeed that Northern Ireland can do it on its own, because it will actually require the involvement of the European Union and the rest of the United Kingdom? So, Minister. The reality is, would you agree with me, that your plan, while of benefit, will not stand up unless it includes a wide-ranging and comprehensive uh, green economy intervention? I think, um, and I thank the member for his question, but he somewhat makes my point for me. Um, in uh, my uh, economic recovery plan, we have said that we need specific interventions in relation um, to the green economy in relation to that sustainable, prosperous future that we see as being really important for Northern Ireland. That will involve me working across the executive, working with other ministers. And of course, I'm already doing that if, if uh, the member um, is um, knowledgeable about uh, the project that I am already doing with um, Northern Ireland Water which is innovative, it is the first of its kind, will lead to greater sustainability and, of course, of course demonstrates working right across the executive to produce a joined-up plan for economic recovery. As we emerge um, from the dark times of the COVID pandemic, the most and the important thing that we can do is to help to recover our economy. And recover our health service and recover our services to people in their communities. These are vastly important. And this House has my commitment that I will work across the executive to do these very important things. I call Pat Cadney. Thank you and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, uh, do you consider the expenditure allocation? for the greener economy to be sufficient to enable Northern Ireland to meet the UK's 2050 zero target, or does she intend to approach the Finance Minister to bid for additional funding? What we sow now, we will reap in the future. The Member makes a very, very uh, important point. In my economic recovery plan, I have identified as some that uh, would uh, give us some element of recovery. Um, for Northern Ireland and indeed for the green uh, economy in Northern Ireland. That economy is already happening all around us. I don't know if, if uh, some of you saw the story last week on uh, the mission to build uh, zero emission uh, boats and vessels in Belfast and the huge and really innovative um, changes that are being made to do that. Um, the transport um, of, and the use of hydrogen buses um, is absolutely so it's, it's happening all around us it's happening across the different parts uh, of this executive the economic recovery plan is a live document it will evolve and develop and so too will our asks of the finance minister to fund the green economy as we move forward and thank you minister for your answer so far does the minister um, Sorry, does the Minister acknowledge that as well as providing us with a sound, sustainable economy, that a green recovery that delivers cleaner air and water, as well as one that protects biodiversity, can actually help populations when it comes to developing natural defences to future pandemics? Well, I'm no expert uh, in this uh, matter, 
But I do know that uh, that uh, greener recovery, that more sustainable environment, that more sustainable hopes uh, for businesses um, and manufacturing and so on as we go forward is hugely important for the benefit of all of our lives, um, not least uh, for the jobs and prosperity which I think it can bring with us as well. Oh, William Urban. The Minister has identified the importance of clean energy as a priority for her as, she, as we rebuild and regrow uh, our local economy. What are the future opportunities for the hydrogen economy? Again, can I thank the member uh, for uh, his question. Um, I think that this is one of the most exciting elements uh, of the work uh, that we are doing. It is cutting edge uh, and it has the ability to really drive forward uh, the investment opportunities uh, that uh, investing in the green economy will, will give us. It is an opportunity to build on our world leading capabilities in renewables and advanced manufacturing to uh, create those sustainable jobs. And these opportunities can be realised through producing green hydrogen, supplying this for clean heat, power and transport, developing and manufacturing cutting edge technology such as electrolysers. And there will also be export opportunities for advanced manufacturing in global hydrogen supply chains. I have, as I have referenced already, provided 5 million funding to Northern Ireland Water to undertake an innovative oxygen and hydrogen demonstrator project, the first such project in the United Kingdom and Ireland. And that will also help build momentum in the hydrogen economy. I am aware of many other exciting and emerging projects in this space, and I look forward to engaging with those who are developing this cutting-edge technology. I call Joanne Bundy. Question four, please. Can I thank the member uh, for her question? My department undertakes ongoing monitoring of the Northern Ireland economy which includes the impact of COVID-19, leaving the EU and, in particular, the protocol. In the short term, the impact of all of these are intermingled. It is early days to have a full measure of the economic impact of leaving the EU and the implementation of the protocol. For businesses, initial survey data indicates that a lot of the initial impact has been focused on the friction of movement of goods from GB to Northern Ireland. Some of these issues will be familiar to those who have been meeting with businesses in the last few months. Issues around customs and the additional burden they place on businesses, lack of preparedness from GB suppliers, late communication of guidance and parcels, and a wide range of other businesses or other issues. While these impacts are difficult to quantify, surveys from Enterprise NI and Manufacturing NI have found that a substantial proportion of their members have experienced issues with supply chains from GB. In 2018, Northern Ireland companies purchased goods and services worth £13.4 billion from Great Britain, 63% of all external purchases. Of this, £10.4 billion was in goods and £3 billion in services. This demonstrates the level of dependence on GB for individuals and businesses for their supply chains. At the same time, the DERA Permanent Secretary indicates that although we have 0.5% of the EU population, we have 20% of the goods and the checks on, the, or the, the checks on those goods. That surely is neither proportionate nor sustainable and is a reflection of the cost to businesses of the protocol. Joanne Bunting, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I trust that following the Minister's answer, those in this House who laud the protocol and who call for its rigorous implementation will note the extent to which our external purchases are sourced from GB and will reflect on the significant challenges that this protocol presents to our local business. Can I ask the Minister if she would turn her attention uh, to consumers and outline the implications of rigorous implementation of this protocol for them if action isn't taken? Again, uh, can I thank uh, the member for her question? Um, there is absolutely no doubt that for consumers, uh, the protocol mainly represents 
um, additional cost and less choice. Um, and that is very evident across a range of products in Northern Ireland. But just two weeks ago, I think it was now, I met with uh, those who deliver parcels to Northern Ireland. Um, and they were indicating that if our government had not taken unilateral action, then many of the small providers uh, of uh, goods to Northern Ireland would simply not bother because it simply would not be worthwhile. Whereas they were also finding that there was additional cost uh, to those who were simply getting uh, normal, everyday items uh, from GB. This is not a sustainable position for consumers or for the economy in Northern Ireland. And again, I reiterate my call for a permanent solution to this that does away with the frictions of the protocol. Nicole Keeve Archibald. And if only the Minister and her party had been as exercised about economic impacts when they were cheerleading a hard Brexit. But does the Minister agree that stunts like that of the DUP era Minister and solo runs by the British Government are causing even greater uncertainty and instability for businesses? And since, since it's clear that the protocol is here to stay, efforts should instead focus on working through the structures of the protocol to resolve issues. I'm afraid the member is somewhat um, confused in the way she looks at this kind of thing. Um, for those who think that um, unilateral action by our government to protect businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland is nothing more than a solo run is foolish in the extreme. It really is um, quite unbelievable. And especially when we consider the advice from retail organisations, etc., who have indicated that actually, while they're not that fond of a solo run, they thought that those actions were absolutely necessary to protect businesses and consumers in Northern Ireland. My party um, did not advocate for the protocol. We are not the champions of the rigorous implementation of the protocol, and those who are need to reflect on the damage it is causing to Northern Ireland. Call Matthew Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I have the Invest NI website in front of me. I'm reading from a page which says uh, this dual market access, referring to the protocol position, means that Northern Ireland can become a gateway for the sale of goods to two of the world's largest markets. This is a unique position for manufacturers based in Northern Ireland, as well as those seeking a pivotal location from which to service GB and EU markets. These additional benefits further enhance Northern Ireland's already strong proposition as a prime location to establish or grow a business. Minister, what of that do you disagree with? Again, can I thank the member for his question, because he points out what an absolutely brilliant place Northern Ireland is to invest in and to do business in. But it will be even better when we do away with the frictions of the protocol. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, a bit flabbergasted as I stand here. Uh, Minister, go back to Mr O'Toole's point there. Can I ask you, um, those of us who are trying our best to um, help businesses cope with the, outfall, you know, the fallout from Brexit um, and the protocol that has, has resulted from that. Can I ask you what work you have actually done um, to promote dual access to both the UK market and the EU market for our businesses in Northern Ireland that are looking for the opportunities? I will always seek um, to look for opportunities for Northern Ireland businesses. I take that as part uh, of my work in the Department for the Economy. But for businesses in Northern Ireland, before they can look at the outward working um, and the export, etc., they also need to be sure that their supply chains are secure and that those intermediate goods that make up part of those supply chains will not be subject to tariffs as the protocol would have it. I think the member needs to reflect on these issues um, and uh, maybe uh, research the impact the tariffs will have on businesses in Northern Ireland. Call Christopher Stelford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, from the Minister's earlier answers, it's apparent 
that we're going to be seeing in television advertising a lot more asterisks offer not available in Northern Ireland. Would my honourable friend agree with me that that should be a change to offer not available in Northern Ireland thanks to Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the Alliance Party and the Greens? Order, members. Order. Thank you. Well, of course, I do believe that those people who prioritised um, checks between us and our greatest mark, our biggest market, and I have given and I have taken some time to specifically give the figures that are independent of the Department of the Economy in relation to the importance of that market, will have to bear responsibility and will have to answer to the Northern Ireland public for the additional cost, the additional inconvenience and the lack of choice that this rigorous implementation of the protocol brings. Erimer, Sean Lynch, I call Sean Lynch. Question five, please. Can I thank the member uh, for his question? In January, I announced the cancellation of BTEC examinations for the remainder of this academic year. BTECs are offered across the UK by Pearson Awarding Organisation, and I have ensured alignment with England and Wales to ensure the ongoing portability and integrity of qualifications and to protect the interests of all of our learners. Off call, in conjunction with SEA regulation, recently consulted on the alternative awarding arrangements for vocational qualifications in 2021, and the outcome was announced on the 25th of February. BTEX will be awarded using teacher-assessed grades submitted by the Learning Centre, similar to the arrangements for GCSEs and A-levels. This will require the teacher or lecturer to make an informed judgment on the result using a variety of evidence, such as performance of tasks or assessments that have already been completed. These judgments will be quality assured within the school, college or training provider, and then by the awarding organisation prior to the issue of results. Awarding organisations are now required to provide clear and timely guidance to learning centres on the assessment and awarding approaches to be implemented timing and when centres need to submit information, the records that they should maintain on the nature of any centre-based quality assurance. I hope that all of that informa our information will be with the centres uh, by the end of March or the early stages in April, because it's essential for progress. Uh, Sean Lynch, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. The Minister, as he said, those uh, A-level exams, a decision was made them back in January, yet BTEC students are left waiting for a full clarity over their assessments. So, in light of your statement on Friday, how will you ensure that grades for practical assessments are awarded before the end of the academic year? As I have said in my um, initial response to your question, um, those who are doing BTEX as in a written examination will follow a pathway similar to A-levels or GCSEs. I want um, our young students who are doing professional qualifications and need those uh, practical um, elements of their course to be vouched for and to be practically done, to be able to go back into further education colleges as quickly as possible so that this element of the course can proceed um, in as efficient a way as possible and that we will be able to make those assessments and those professional qualifications or those professional judgments on those uh, uh, qualifications as soon as we can. I want our young people to be able to progress either to the next level or into work. That time's up for the uh, list of questions. And we'll now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Meg Nesbitt. The uh, Irish News Today reports on the closure of a £65 million Crescent Capital Forward Development Fund, a venture capital a fund for technology, life science and manufacturing businesses, and that those currently in receipt uh, of funds have had their, those funds returned. 
the Minister tell us, is this true? What is going on? And, and what this means for the companies who, in good faith, drew down money from this capital fund? My understanding is that no one uh, has any uh, need to fear uh, in relation to the fund, but that the fund manager was unable uh, to um, have uh, additional and uh, private finance uh, and equity realised, uh, and therefore the fund uh, was not sustainable. Uh, I thank the Minister uh, for, for that assurance. However, Within the body of the report, it says, and I quote, with regard to a previous iteration of this fund, because this is the fourth iteration that's cancelled, it's understood a number of companies in the third fund have been interviewed as part of a probe into how monies may have been managed. Are we looking at son of RHI? Um, I don't think the member should uh, get uh, carried away on this particular issue. Um, all of these issues will be investigated and dealt with in the normal manner, etc. Call Christopher Stalford. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Sir, I'm sure that all members uh, will welcome the progress in the rollout of the vaccine, the reduction of the virus, and the return of some young people to school. The minister has already published her plan to reopen, recover and rebuild the local economy. But would she agree with me that we need to start indicating to local businesses when they will be able to start trading again? Can I thank uh, the member for his question? Um, we are indeed ready um, when uh, the time is right to reopen and rebuild and to recover our economy. And as I have said during this question time in this House, Nothing is more important to the prosperity and stability uh, of Northern Ireland. I look forward to very soon uh, that uh, being possible, uh, and um, I would encourage um, members in this House to work with me to ensure uh, that it can happen as soon as uh, possible. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Sunday is obviously Mother's Day. Uh, on behalf of Trinity, Oliver, Cameron, and Abigail Stalford, can I ask: Will they be allowed to go to the local florist to buy their mother a bunch of flowers on a click and collect basis? Um, um, uh, again, I, I thank the member for, for his question. <laughs> I got the wrong side. Sorry. I thank the member for his question, uh, and I am glad that uh, we have been able to restore uh, some click and collect services to businesses. It is but a very, very limited. Uh, form of reopening of the economy. I would have liked um, for Trinity uh, and uh, her siblings to be able to purchase uh, flowers through um, a local uh, florist. Unfortunately, my proposal around this was not supported um, at uh, the executive. Um, and I think that this is a pity because this does raise um, issues around how we treat small independent retailers and the equity with which we treat them. You will be able to go and buy flowers in any of the multinationals, but you will not be able to go to that small independent retailer and use a click and collect service. I regret that that hasn't been possible, and I hope that it will become possible very soon. Um, could I ask the Minister if uh, or have all payments under the wet pubs business support scheme been made? Um, I, I will write with the exact figures uh, to the member under uh, the scheme, uh, but this is one of a number of schemes that we are obviously rolling out. Um, my last, when I last checked on the actual figures of the scheme, um, around about half of the business that we thought were eligible uh, had applied and were being paid, and there were still some officials who were chasing up some of the other um, businesses that still had not come forward for the scheme. Um, and, uh, but I will write with the exact numbers to the member. Okay, I thank the Minister very much for that. Um, could, could I ask the Minister just when payments under the, the large tourism and hospitality business support scheme will commence then, please? Um, I um, signed off on this um, at the end of last week. 
Uh, my understanding is that they will be paid in the very, very near future, and of course they must be completed before the 31st of March. I am glad to have been able um, to support um, our local businesses in this way. This is a very substantial scheme of support to local businesses, and I know that they have welcomed this, and it will help to sustain them until we can get them reopened and fully functioning in the economy. Nicole Mervyn Story. And thank the Minister for her answers thus far. I welcome the publication of the Minister's Action Plan. And obviously, it is a plan which is focused on ensuring that our economy is reopened. But would she agree with me that the Executive, in its entirety, and this Assembly, if it is serious about recovery, needs to ensure that there is the adequate and appropriate funding alongside that recovery plan so that it is uh, in a place where it actually can do what it says on the tin, and that is aid recovery. Can I thank the member for his question? It is a really important one. We have published our economic recovery plan. We have also a plan for a Northern Ireland Skills Fund to recover and invest in the skills of our people. It is absolutely vital that as we emerge from this dark place of COVID, that we are able to put that stimulus into the economy and to uh, fund economic recovery, not that is just immediate, but that is also for the long term. And so I look forward to working with the Finance Minister and indeed across the Executive so that we can properly fund the Economic Action Recovery Plan, that we can properly fund our skills plans and indeed that we can fund those employability interventions that will be really very, very necessary from the Department for Communities. Mervyn Story, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Obviously, we would hope that that would be more uh, benef or more successful than the bids that you did put to the, the uh, finance minister. When you look at the way in which they were dealt with in terms of the total amount of bids, not just the amount of money, but would you also can agree with me that a recovery budget alongside the current budget that we will complete today is necessary so that people clearly understand and clearly see where the finances are in relation to how the plan will be delivered? Yes, I think that it is absolutely important to have transparency in the way that we deal with the budget. I think it is important that we were, are able to separate out those departmental budgets from the actual recovery budget um, that we have. And we have substantial funds that have come to us from our national government to actually provide that stimulus for economic recovery. And if we are serious about the economy and all that it represents, the, the jobs it represents, the mortgages it pays, the rent it pays, the food on the table, and so on, then we will fund that economic recovery budget and get ahead with making Northern Ireland that prosperous place that we all want it to be. And Irma, Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. My August can call you. And thank the Minister for answer so far. Minister, I am aware that Mid Ulster Council have written to your executive colleague Nicola Mallon in relation to the current what can only be described as an absolute mess that is happening at Granville Industrial Estate in Dungannon. Could you give a commitment that you will work with Nicola Mallon to, to deal with the issues that are currently facing the businesses in Granville Industrial Estate? I will, of course, be happy um, to work with any other minister in relation to any of the difficulties faced by businesses. And indeed, if the me uh, member wants to drop me a note about that, I'll be happy to take it up with her as well. Supplementary, Linda Dillon. I appreciate that offer, Minister. Thank you. I'd also like to make the point that currently, Mid Ulster District Council area have are bringing to the GVA here over £2 billion, and yet we don't have one single area of INI lands. Invest and I have no lands within the whole of Mid Ulster District Council area. We're the only council area right across the north that are in that position that do not have any lands for businesses to grow. That's a very serious situation for our council area and for our constituency. And I'm wondering, would the minister commit to meeting with myself along with our council officials to discuss the issues and the challenges that face them in relation to not only this, but there are obviously wider issues around infrastructure in the Middle East area. 
I will, of course, be very happy to meet. Um, that is, is never an issue, and I meet uh, a wide, very, very wide variety of people from right across this House on all of the issues uh, pertaining to their constituency. Can I say two things? Um, I think we should all be very proud of that manufacturing tradition that is so evident uh, in Mid Ulster. It is one of the areas of Northern Ireland that um, is. Um, excels at those uh, advanced manufacturing capabilities, that is, uh, still investing, producing jobs, and so on. I am really pleased to see the developments in relation to the city deals and growth deal uh, for the area, and of course will be working with uh, the local councils within that growth deal uh, to, put, uh, to push that forward. But also, um, Invest uh, Northern Ireland have uh, significantly invested in businesses within the area. And just a few months ago, I was with uh, the council chairman um, at a business in the local area uh, where there was an investment of over £1 million uh, to push forward um, that uh, particular uh, part of the uh, economy. So I do look forward to engaging with the member and indeed uh, with the council uh, and stand ready to help. Can we please bring the member Carl Mullen on screen, please? <laughs> Moving on, we uh, call. I call Sinead Bradley. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I didn't expect to get to myself, but sure, technology is a great thing. Um, just in relation to the COVID disruption grant, obviously the minister will be aware that that's been offered to students st studying in Northern Ireland for higher education. Is any consideration being given to offering that to further education students? Because I've had correspondence from a number of them in relation to that. Technology is indeed wonderful when it's all working and, 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 and going to plan. But anyway, you got your question in. Um, I am delighted that uh, students who are studying um, at degree level within further education will be eligible for the COVID disruption payment. And of course, further education students um, have been eligible for the hardship funds. Just uh, last week, we started the process of addressing that issue of digital poverty among students in further education with a specific grant of £60 for the data that they will be using um, at their own home, and uh, with the distribution of over 500 devices um, in order to help with this very, very real issue of digital poverty. No student should be left unsupported in this particular area. And Northern Ireland has the most comprehensive and most generous package of student support of anywhere in these islands. I am very proud of that. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. But it is disappointing that the grant is not going to be extended to further education students. One of the other issues is that for high, higher education students studying outside Northern Ireland, there is that issue where they are not eligible for that. Will the Minister commit to look at this again in terms of making sure that they are eligible for that support? Again, the member raises a really uh, important issue. We were able um, to um, introduce the COVID disruption payment to students who study here in Northern Ireland because we were able to pay the institutions here in Northern Ireland that are publicly funded in order to support those students. Students who uh, live and uh, who study in England, Scotland or Wales and are from Northern Ireland can of course avail of the funding that has been made available in those areas to support students who are studying in those areas. And in England just recently, um, there was an additional £50 million um, advanced to support student hardship. In Scotland, I think there was in the region of £30 million, and in Wales in the region of £40 million. So Northern Ireland students suffering are studying in GB are absolutely not without support. Call Melissa McHugh, and you will not have time for supplementary. Uh, Minister, uh, you will be well aware that uh, caravan parks have been closed for much of the pandemic, yet people are still expected to pay pitch fees. And as I understand it, Minister, your department has returned unspent money from other grant schemes and that the Finance Minister continues to ask for bids to be made for COVID-related support. 
Minister, will you consider providing a grant scheme for caravan site owners which would allow them to either waive fees or reduce fees to those with caravans on site? Again, can I thank the member uh, for his question? Um, and he raises a couple of issues that I think are very important and um, I'm glad to have the opportunity uh, to talk about today. Caravan parks and the reopening of caravan parks is probably the single biggest element of correspondence that I get uh, from constituents. And I do hope that we will be in a position soon to make sure that those people who are paying site fees will be able to uh, go back and enjoy their caravans in safety um, in uh, the coming months um, and as soon as uh, the health um, and the, the, the pandemic allows. And I think that that is important to say. It is very important for a large element of our community. <coughs> Many of the caravan parks, of course, do remain open for those who live permanently in them. Um, or for key workers who are perhaps shielding um, at any stage. Um, and uh, they have availed of the generic funds that have been available um, either nationally or locally. Members, the time is up, and that concludes uh, question time. I would ask members to take a raise before we return to the second stage debate on the damages returns on investment bill.